Hey guys, Gary here. This is the first video in a series, Climbing the Rating Ladder, the Gary Guide. We'll be looking at games at a certain rating range, this one up to a thousand. You're gonna be looking for common mistakes, how to capitalize on, on them, and also what kind of skills you need to get up to the level and higher. Okay, the first game I played against 964 from Switzerland, and let's take a look at this game. It was a very quick one. E4, E5. I noticed that this is the most common opening at this level. Very, very likely to get this position very often, maybe over 50% of the time. My opponent played D4. Another common move, it's called the Scotch opening. The first subset of the King's Pawn opening, which was E4, E5. I took, he took back. This position, I like to play Bishop C5, developing my bishop attacking this knight, and the soft spot on f2. I noticed that a lot of games, this f2 pawn becomes a target for a quick checkmate. So in this position, his bishop is knight is under attack. He played knight c6. And normal people would try to take this knight. However, theory says this move is actually one of the best moves black can play in this position, threatening a checkmate. This is an introduction to forcing moves. Moves that are checks, moves that are threatening mate, moves that are captures. These moves have a lot of power because they force their opponent to stop what they're doing, stop what they want to do, and defend against this. So I could take the I could have taken the knight, however, I'm going to first threaten checkmate. And once he moves the pawn, then I can recapture the knight. Or let's say if he plays bishop e3, I could actually take the bishop. Once again, threatening checkmate, he takes back. Then I take the knight. What happened? I've actually doubled his pawns. So that's a huge benefit of threatening checkmate here. If he plays f3, then I could play pawn takes knight. And notice that he won't be able to castle because his pawn is up there. Now my opponent quickly played bishop b5. Not sure what that was about because, yeah, I guess... Having a whole board vision, being aware of the opponent's tactical threats is something um, that's commonly missed here. So I simply play queen f2 and checkmated um, xqc style. I mean, one of the YouTuber famous Swiss streamers and YouTubers got checkmated like this in a very famous video on, on YouTube. You guys can search it up, Penguin uh, versus xqc. So this happened in the game. Very common uh, checkmate in this level. So I play the next game immediately afterwards. This was against 361, another five minute game. I played e4, my opponent played e6, the French defense. Although theory, I don't think he was following theory. I grabbed the center. It's one of the most important things to do in the opening to grab the center with your pawns, open up the pieces and develop. Now, normally black should play d5 here. However, my opponent played d6, already showing that, okay, uh, not the best strategy, you have to get your bishop out of the stuff, and in this case, the bishop is clearly in the stuff. So, I continue normal development. I like to develop my kingside minor pieces first, bishop and the knight, because I like to castle quickly. If I were to castle queenside, I had to move the queen as well. That's also a strategy. I prefer to castle kingside, because that's more secure than the queenside usually, and it's faster. I put play knight h6. Yeah, normally you don't put the knight on the rim. Here. Now I could take this bit the knight and double this pawn. But I realize that I can do it later as well. I'll wait till he castles and then I'll take. Now if he wants to go back, that's a lot of time wasted, so I don't mind. What I don't want to happen is me castling and then taking that knight and this rook coming in and attacking me later and him castling the other side. So part of a strategy is to kind of wait and see approach here. So I'm just gonna develop my bishop to the center. Now I castle, play this. I try to grab more center space, get the middle, put the knights under the pawn. Now he castles. Okay, perfect timing for me to take. Let me do it. King is very unsafe. Already I'm looking at ways to attack this king side. Queen d2, maybe e5 opening the bishop. However, I realized that I still had to follow the basics. Get your pieces out first. You gotta 
first get everything out before you attack. So I developed my knight to center square, and I was planning to play this. My opponent played b5. So another common mistake is just counting the attackers and defenders. Of course, I have way more people attacking this pawn, so I just grab this, grab the pawn, and now duke with the knight. Opponent played knight a6. Okay, but it doesn't do anything about defending this king side, so I'm just gonna attack that. Yeah, so seeing the opponent, seeing the whole board, seeing the opponent's idea is very important. So I grab the pawn. I'm just gonna play this move and get checkmate. Play e5. Now that does stop my plan of attacking with the bishop. However, another case of I have more attackers here, so I'm just gonna grab the pawn. And I like this move because not just because I have a pawn, I can also actually fork here. And don't forget this queen is attacking the knight. If the bishop were to move away from the diagonal, I can actually collect the knight as well. And notice that I have everything protected. My bishop protecting the knight. I'm making sure that everything is indeed protected, and I'm fine. Bishop d6. Oh, I think he forgot about his um my queen there. So I took it. Free bishop. And look at my pieces, they're very active, right? They're well placed. Okay, that was a good move. Pinning my knight. Now, I need to find a move that defends the knight and maybe advances my plan as well. So I played knight c4. I like this move. It's a multi-purpose move. It attacks the rook, defends my knight, and I actually cleared the square for my pawn so my queen and bishop can do a nice little checkmate. Rook takes the pawn. Oh, I can take this free rook, but let me... Again, threatening mate is very, very valuable. Very effective. I can take this rook later. No problem. But let me threaten that mate first. It's very hard to stop it. My opponent played rook b4, and then I ended up checkmating. Once again, poison kiss checkmate, or in your face mate, in your ear, I guess? Either way, my opponent could have played f5, but then I would en passant, and the attack would continue. Very hard to stop this attack. So... In this game, black didn't really gain too much space in the center. It's a little passive. Put the knight on the side and castled into a an open king position and then lost a bunch of material. And being aware of all the threats was, was important. Let's move on to the next game. This was against somebody from France, Norm Malone. Played e4, e5. Once again, we get the same opening. I was surprised to see the same exact scotch opening one more time, just one game apart. I did the same exact thing, bishop c5. I like this, eyeing this pawn, knight c6, and our favorite move, queen f6. Okay, is he gonna fall for the mate this time? No, not a bad move. However, his king is now really, really airy. Can't castle that way. and. Now, I was debating between how do I actually capture this knight? And I concluded that I'm going to take with my d pawn. Now, double pawns aren't the, aren't the best thing in the world. However, the point is to keep my bishop open and develop quickly and attack as king. If I get checkmate or if I get some big attack, things like double pawn won't matter. It only matters in a very equal endgame where somehow these four pawns will dominate my three pawns, like 25 moves down the road. So these things are long-term problems. Short-term is more important, especially in the opening stage. e5 was played. Probably should have developed his pieces, like knight c3. I was debating, should I put my queen back here or queen over here? This seems queen is a bit more out there. This is a bit safer. I realized that queen here is better because it's more active. It's doing more things. The bishop can't move because the queen will take the pawn. So it's actually quite safe here. And another thing I realized, what sold me on this move is bishop f5 would be a battery on this pawn, works together with the queen. And another thing was the queen e7 would have blocked my knight from going to the second best square, I guess, rather than e5, I mean f6 because of the e5 pawn. Therefore, this move fits in with the grander strategy. Knight c3 was played. Doesn't do anything about my move, though. Bishop f5. 
pawn in thought for a while here. How do you defend this pawn? When you start attacking like this, people start to crumble like a cookie in a sense because they're worried about something and then they forget. So bishop d3 was played blocking this pawn. However, as we said before, this queen was attacking this pawn. So I just grabbed it. And surprise, surprise, this actually also threatens checkmate on that same f2 square. Plus, as a bonus, I have this devastating threat of queen takes h1. Opponent played queen e2. That was the only one of the only moves. Although there was a really good move here. Um, the best move, rook f1, which would have guarded the checkmate. However, black's king side, white's king side is so bad, it's going to be gg. Queen e2, queen takes rook. Now, after queen f1, I had a um, dilemma here. Should I keep the queens on the board or not? Because I'm up material and my king is, I'm attacking this king. But I realized that my bishop and my queen are both attacked. I wouldn't be able to keep the queen without losing my bishop. And simplification is generally good when you're up material. I'm up a rook and a pawn here. So I decided to trade queens and trade bishops as well. And now you just play normal chess. You just gotta op you know, develop your pieces, activate your pieces like normal. And since the end game, I can also try to collect some of these weak pawns. And that's what I did. Now, you can't be careless even if you're winning. You know, when you're actually going to win the game, it's when you have to focus even more. There's a tendency to just forget the opponent even has a threat. They can still, they can still create threats, even some checkmating threats even. So you have to be careful. So you gotta make sure you save your pieces, of course. And I developed my knight. I did it to h6 because it's gonna go here anyway. Knight on the rim is bad, but if it bounces off the edge, that's fine immediately, right? It's only bad if it stays there for a long time. Okay, king e3, that wasn't the best move, but I really didn't have any good spots for it. So I just played my knight to f5. Check. I was wondering, is he gonna go king back here or king over here? This looks really dangerous for him, right? Because the king is getting coming to my spot. Okay, there's a mate here somewhere. H5 check, takes my knight check. Uh, that's a bit murky. It's a bit murky. I'm gambling there. I really wanna do this, but the knight's there. I can protect my knight. I can also check. I decide to check because it saves my knight and brings the king forward. And here I thought if, if I could get this smooth, that would be really close to checkmate. So how can I distract the knight? I could also want to attack this king with my bishop. So I actually sacrificed my bishop. Kind of an intuitive sacrifice. I didn't exactly know the full checkmating sequence. Well, I found it after this move. I need to play this and that'll be mate. But the problem is the knight is under attack. So this knight did a little dance. It went, it went over here. It was there before. Now it's gonna go back. And wow, what a beautiful mating net here. My threat is to play this. My knight that was a liability here. Now it's a savior. Rook is guarding this. And we have a beautiful checkmate. It's a bit aesthetic. This knight was on h6. And then it went to f5, then it came back to h6, then it came back to f5 again to finish the job. That was kind of funny. So good game. Um, I think what the opponent did wrong was not seeing some of these threats, right? Queen g6 and queen g2 and neglecting the development of the pieces. Too many pawn moves were made. As you can see, I'm playing black, so white goes first. He should have more pieces developed at this point. So perhaps e5 was bad. Should have played knight c3, right? Or something else. So that was a mistake. Let's go to the next game. This was an interesting game. 988 from Lebanon. I played e4. e5. Once again, we get the same exact king pawn opening on all games so far. I play Italian. I like this opening, once again, putting that pressure on f7. Bishop c5, good move. c3, I like to do this move. Um, especially, I think it works very well at this rating range. Trying to grab the center. 
you want to capture with the pawn on c3. So you basically play this called the Greco line. D6. That doesn't really deal with this move, actually. Black should have played knight f6, hitting this pawn. D4. And now we have the snowplow center. I love the snowplow center. They control the middle. They chase away the opponent's pieces. You can build your pieces around that. And they really make your opponent's pieces push back and inactive. So that's the snowplow center strategy. Very important. If you can get this, your your opening was a success. That was a good move by the opponent. Bishop g4, pinning my knight. Undermining. Sometimes you know, when you don't have center, you can try to attack and win the attack and undermine the opponent's pawns and win them. That's what he's doing. So that was a good move. I need to find a good defense here. I can play bishop b3, but I decided to play bishop, G, bishop b5 and pin the knight. If he takes here now, I was going to take with the pawn. And then if he takes with the bishop, I will take the bishop with my queen. And he cannot take my queen. Because the bishop pins the knight, and the knight is absolutely pinned. And I have a threat here of playing d5, which would win the knight. So I like this move. It was kind of a defense, but sometimes the best defense is offense. And I'm doing that. Play a6, putting the question to the bishop. I Most of the time, I prefer to keep the pin, especially if it's a situation where... You know, I benefit from putting pressure on that pin and winning the piece. I should just keep the pin. I cash it in by winning the knight with the pawn rather than just taking with the bishop. Knight f6. So opponent missed this move, d5. And now I win a piece. Should have probably unpinned with bishop d7 or at least take it and think from there. So I want a bishop. I want a knight here. Full piece up. Rook b8, makes sense. Now again, normal chess mode, we gotta just, we're up, we're up a knight here, but we just gotta castle and bring on our pieces. Normal opening strategy. In this moment I decided we need to pin. I really like this monster pin here. He can take my pawn, that's fine. I'm just gonna add on to that and open up his king. I have an extra piece here, I can sacrifice one pawn to attack his king. Played this. So now it's a lot of captures in this position. So I calculated, you know, when there's checks, captures, threatening mate, you should look at those to see, you know, can, does any of those, you know, work? And here it does. I took the knight knowing that if he takes here, his king's going to be open. He's going to take with the queen. But now they're in position for a double attack. And that's what happened. Should be six. Now normal chess time. There are no more tactics. Let's improve the bishop. Let's crystallize these pieces. The bishop is now excellent in the middle. It's protected by the pawn. Pawn's protecting the bishop. I love this crystal. And play normal chess. Ooh. But once I put my bishop here, there is a... I smell some tactics now. Bishop f7. I know that this bishop is undefended. If I can play knight g5 with a check, I can win the bishop back. Knight g5 check. Free bishop. Get it, get it back. But I know I'd play proper chess here. Guys, this is the whole point of this video is to show proper chess at, the, at this level. I'm supposed to play queen takes g4, but I really couldn't resist it. I play queen d5. You'll see what happens here. King h8. Knight of seven check. Knight eight six check. We're going for a smothered mate. Can you guys see the win here? Pause the video. If you do, congrats. Queen g8 check. Beautiful move. Sacrificing the queen. And now a beautiful smothered checkmate. That was the whole point of this queen d5. Let's go back a little bit. Rewind. Worst case scenario, he can block with his bishop, but I win the bishop back, which I was going to win there anyway. Even if he plays the best move, it's still the same outcome. Plays king here, I can mate. But since he played this, I have this Philidor's Legacy Checkmate. It was written by Philidor in some, some book a long time ago, so it's called Philidor's Legacy. 
beautiful, beautiful mate. Okay, we're going to play one more game. E4, best by test. He plays the Karo Khan. So since he's not directly controlling the square, I'm going to put my second pawn on d4. And he plays it correctly with the Karo Khan. So I'm going to just guard my pawn with my knight and develop my knight. It's a multi-purpose move. And now the problem for black is he can't develop his knight here. That was the only flaw with Karo Khan. I play Karo Khan myself as black. It's a good opening. Um, however, it has some flaws as well. Knight of six. Okay, so my knight's under attack. I'm going to take that knight and double his pawns. So black has a slightly worse pawn structure. I'm just going to develop my bishop. I want to go here, but then he would take my, my pawn. So I could actually go here, which I'm going to do. So you, wanna, you can develop here. I could have played knight f3 as well and then developed here. They were both fine. Bishop e6. Hmm. So if I capture, I do fix his pawn, but I open up his king a bit more. I think that's actually worth it. It does fix his pawn structure. And also this pawn on e6 could become a target for attack in the future. So it's not that I, I want to check here, but he just blocks it. So it might be a waste of time. I'm going to play knight f3, castle, and develop my pieces and attack this pawn. Ooh, that's a, a bit too many pawn moves in this opening stage. I don't recommend that. I'm going to try to take advantage of it immediately. I am developing my queen. There is a saying, don't bring the queen out too early. The coast is pretty much clear here. There's a lot of pieces have been traded off already and black has no aggressive pieces out. So the coast is clear for the queen to come out and try to take advantage of specific weaknesses in the game. It's not too far out either. And now I'll play this check. This will prevent my opponent from getting developed. King has to move can castle in check. So it's probably going to go here because it protects this pawn. And then I'll just develop my pieces and continue my attack. So here I'm going to castle kingside and then play rookie one, attack this pawn. Of course, this is not a completely winning advantage yet because there's no clear way to break through with this pieces because I haven't developed yet. Rook e1, this was the plan. Attack this pawn and get the rook to open file. Now what does black play here? Probably queen e7 protecting this pawn. And I'm going to develop my bishop. Bishop d2. Ooh, opening the king, opening the position when your king is in the middle it's not the best strategy. It's not the best strategy. Now, this really loosens up a lot of these squares. I can directly take this. There are also ways to kind of bounce around as well. So I'm just thinking here, should I go for direct or should I kind of go in these weaknesses? My gut tells me that this is the best way to go for it. Because it's clear that these squares I can invade and attack the king. This one is pretty protected. So I didn't need, it wasn't like I'm going to win material to play defense. Although it's, it's a completely fine move. This seems to be more tuned to this, to the weaknesses in black's position. Again, knight in the rim is dim. Unless it bounces off immediately from the rim to the middle, right? So that's the plan here. Knight f5, which would threaten a devastating check, and also this bishop. Okay, that's a great move. Queen e8, because now I can't play knight f5. Although he's not really threatening to trade because my knight would be forking the, the king and the rook. So here I could continue just developing my pieces. I can also move my queen away and prepare the knight coming in here as well. What's better? Not sure. They both seem okay. I'm going to play it in a little teasing fashion and just develop my bishop. 
This bishop, if this bishop moves from this diagonal, I could actually check the king. Also, I bring my last guy. This guy's watching TV. YouTube? I don't know. Okay. Looks like the patience paid off here. Um, white um, is going to win an exchange here. Rook for a knight. That's called the exchange. So winning more material. I'm okay with that. Um, now I can just continue to simplify. Since I'm up um, two points here, I got five point piece for a three point. All I got to do is trade it down and then the extra two points will stand out even more than before. Okay, I see a tactic now. This bishop, if it wasn't there, I could get this bishop. So let me grab this pawn. That is called a discovered attack. Now I calculated that he could actually counterattack, but then I would come back and block this. So now I won another pawn. So I'm up three points. So I have six pawns. He has five. That's one point extra. I have five for three. That's two points of so two plus one. He's simplifying. So here I can actually simplify more. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I can also just check here and then win more pawns. But for, to be, let's play very prosaic here. This is supposed to be educational, calm, proper chess. We're controlling all the chaos in this position. So we want another pawn. This knight is going to come over here. Let's limit that knight. And now that it's the end game, it's time to use something that we haven't used before. The king has to come to the middle. He's fighting too. And one of the best targets, you know, pawns are like children. They got to protect your children, right? So we can go after, it's like taking candy from a baby in a sense. In the end game, these pawns are just totally weak here. So we're going to go after those pawns. Thank you. And now, again, do you alter prosaic? Let's simplify into a king and pawn in game. So we have extra. Um, how many pawns do we have? Three pawns now. That should be more than enough. Even though that transaction was not so beneficial, it just makes it simpler. There's no counterplay with just these pawns. So now we're going to make a pass pawn. Two versus one. Just going to make a queen. So when you're that ahead of material, it's, it's much better to just simplify, even at the cost of losing some, giving some back. He resigned. Good game. So what went wrong for the opponent? He played the opening quite well, actually. This is all theory, like Karakhan. I play this myself. Maybe you'll see it in a future video. Um, where did he go wrong? I think maybe bishop e6. You know, he should just castle. So bishop d6 and castling was correct. Uh, so at certain many points in this game, black should just, just get it over with castle. Um, too many pawn moves was the issue. So these are some of the common mistakes, you know, spending, wasting too much time, not castling, um, giving up the center, um, some of the board vision stuff, you know, tactical, seeing all the threats, seeing what's defended, seeing your opponent's threats, etc. Hope this was helpful. Guys, if you enjoyed it, give a thumbs up, comment, subscribe. We'll probably make this all the way to 2000. Um, let me know your thoughts below. Thanks for watching. Gary signing off. Goodbye.